Winter and the holiday season is upon us, and I think there's uh, probably no more appropriate way uh, to think about that than to hear tonight from our writer in residence, Lynn Cherry, who has established herself, I think, as the one of the leading uh, writers of children's books that deal with environment, uh, those uh, representing uh, a contact with the upcoming generation that I think is all too important. Sometimes I wonder what happened to middle-aged people that I used to, you know, when I was young and they were young, we all talked about the future of the environment. And then something happened. And so now I put a whole lot of faith in, in uh, the outreach to the young generation, uh, to uh, those uh, children that can understand environment, that are passionate about environment, uh, they go home and talk to their parents about environment. And I see that that may be our greatest hope uh, for dealing with the planet we call home. Lynn Charity has done more than I think many people to uh, promote a better understanding of environment, a better environmental ethic, uh, environmental culture among young people. Native of Philadelphia, graduate of Yale and several programs, art, history, and environment. Uh, founder of what's known as the Young Voices of Climate Change, author of, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, the great capo tree, A River Run Wild, and just recently, How We Know What We Know About Our Changing Climate, uh, all of which are uh, available outside uh, from uh, courtesy of Merritt Bookstore, who will be glad to sell you one and get an autograph after the after the talk uh, in our usual partnership with Merritt. Uh, but all of these have had a had huge impact across the country, uh, award-winning uh, in, in several cases, uh, and we're just uh, pleased to be able to have Lynn here as a writer in residence on the Cary campus, uh, continuing our new program of writers and artists in residence, scholars in residence, uh, that attempt to translate science to audiences that need to hear it, and by means that are not perhaps the typical scientific journal. So without further ado, Lynn Cherry, thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to first show some slides, and these are a background about some of the books and um, the scientific institutions where I was fortunate enough to be artist in residence to do these books. And then I'm going to uh, show some films at the end. So um, the question I always get is, when did you start writing and drawing? So this is one of my early works. This is when I was eight years old. And um, I wrote this story about my cat, how I would go out into the woods with my cat. And she taught me to sit still like a statue. And then I could see nature up close and that it was, uh, that was invisible. So I wrote this story, Kitty's Adventures, and when I started illustrating kids' books, I brought it to my publisher, and she said, this is a really good story, but you've improved a little bit as an illustrator since you were eight, so can you redo the illustrations? So I did, and they published it, and this was a book Archie followed me, but it was the same story. And I like to tell kids that because the, the voice that kids have, the, the way that they see the world is sometimes really different than adults. And so um, hold on to those manuscripts that you, you kids write when you write them as a kid. Hold on to them. You might get them published from there. So as a kid, I'd go out in the woods, and I knew that there was this one rock where I, every time I looked under it, there'd be this black spotted salamander. Um, there were places where I knew that there were the red X and um, all these different animals. There were. Uh, trees with holes every year, the same birds would come to those trees. Nests where the same birds or generations of birds would come to those nests. And so this was like my, my these were, these are, I thought it was my friends, my community, just as much as the community up at the, you know, on the street where my friends was my community. And I would go out, as I said, and I'd sit with my cat, sit really still, and, and um, look, one day this female pheasant came right up to my foot and, and sniffed it and then ran off, realizing I was human. But, um, I have had birds let, um, land on me. I was laying in a field, just fell asleep, and I felt this kind of soft 
hanging on my face, and I opened my eyes a little bit. It was these yellow flashes going by my eyes. When I, I opened them up, it was goldfishes, and they were flying so low that their, their weight had been brushing my face. So I had these wonderful experiences in nature. That's why it's so important for kids to get out of nature. And I came home one day from this place that I absolutely loved and knew like the back of my hand, and they were bulldozing it. And they completely destroyed it. They pulled the trees out from the roots. They, I mean, this was my heaven, and it was just my, you know, it was really just a, a tragedy. So that really followed me through my life. And when I grew up and I heard about the destruction of the tropical rainforest, it had this great emotional impact because I thought the number of species that are in these forests and, the, the, and how huge these forests are just thought of all these animals that were losing their homes. And from that feeling, I think, of my own personal loss came the great K-pop tree, which I'm um, sure most of you realize now is you know, kind of a classic. It's been out for 22 years. And it's used in most schools in third grade. And I think part of um, the success of the great K-pop tree is that it is totally scientifically accurate. When I wanted to write this book, I went to Tom Lovejoy, who's an eminent scientist, and he was then the head of World Wildlife Fund. He gave me my first artist in residency, so I actually did this book at World Wildlife Fund. And he said, he brought me around and he said to all the scientists there, give her your photos, give her your expertise. And at the end, they looked through everything, the manuscript and all the pictures, and I've never had a letter in all these 22 years of anything wrong in this book. So this is an emerald green boa, and you can see it's up in the upper right-hand uh, corner. And these books have been translated into most every language. Um, here's a, you know, a jaguar. And then um, a lot of what's wonderful is that these kids are putting on plays about and uh, musicals about the great K-pop tree, and thereby educating the community about the importance of saving the rainforest and the plight of the rainforest. And this was in North Carolina. This was. Um, it was like seeing the, the, the book as if I hadn't read it. I mean, as if I hadn't written it when I saw this play. And it actually brought tears to my eyes, and the whole audience was crying at the end. So I, I realized that, uh, the power of this book. And then, of course, kids, they want to do something. So a lot of kids have started these with pennies for protection or buying acres in the rainforest. And kids have saved over 40,000 acres of rainforest in Monte Verde alone in Costa Rica and other rainforests around the world. So one of the things I've been really fortunate enough to do is to lead this Amazon trip uh, in, in Peru. And this is a little sloth that was brought to us. Um, they, they eat sloth. I mean, the, the native people eat sloth. And they had killed a sloth to eat it. And they hadn't realized that it had a little baby clinging to it because it was way up in the tree. And so they came down the river in their dugout canoe. And they brought us this little sloth that could fit in my hand. And we thought it was no longer alive. But one of the teachers had brought her son, and he said, well, can we try and feed it? So we mixed up some cecropia leaves, and the little boy put the, the bottle in the sloth's mouth, and it revived. And he slept with the sloth every night, and then he had to leave, and I became sloth mother, sleeping with the sloth every night. And by the time I left, it had a big round belly, and it was just fine. And the next year, it was still there at the top of this tree next to the lodge. This is a, this lodge is called a seer. And for any of you who want to accompany me to the Peruvian rainforest, please do. I mean, it's a life-changing experience. We have ornithologists, entomologists, all kinds of ologists, and they will teach you all about the rainforest. And plus, it's just a really amazing visceral experience. So I have flyers outside I can show you. So to, um, to do the research for Flute's journey, I went to Costa Rica. And this book was really important because I realized after the great K-pop tree came out, a lot of teachers were teaching about the rainforest instead of teaching about the forest in their own backyard. And I think it's much more important to know your own backyard and the trees in your backyard and to have a relationship with you know, the outdoors than it is to make um, crepe paper mache models of the rainforest in your classroom. So um, I wanted to make this connection. So Flute the wood thrush, who's right there in the middle, um, you probably have these in your backyard. They, they winter in Costa Rica, but then they fly up and then you know, thousands of miles, and then they fly all the way back down in, um, in, this, in the fall. It's really quite a, a, an amazing um, feat. And they have all kinds of trials and tribulations. This is the cover of Food's Journey, like pesticides on lawns. Um, I tell kids, well, you can do one thing, dissuade your parents from using pesticides on the lawn because they get on the insects and the birds eat them and it can really harm them. 
And the other thing is, of course, the loss of open space. So when I started doing the illustrations for this book, there was a man uh, with the, man, the red house there. He owned that red house. And he, within the year that I was doing these illustrations, he sold some of his land. And they cut some of the land around there. They left the land around the house, but then you can see the clear cut. And then that big rectangle of land above that, that was the Belt Woods. And that was, a, that was given to the Episcopal Church by a man named Seton Belt. When, um, it had been in his family since the colonial days when it was given to them as a land grant from the King of England. And they never cut a tree. So this was eastern old growth. It was magnificent. And so when he was old, he wanted to give it to some place that he could really trust. So he gave it to the Episcopal Church. And they promised that they would never cut a tree or sell the land. Well, he died, they got the will overturned, and for many years, the, his friends were trying to save this, this land. And um, a friend of mine asked me if I would get involved and try and help them save it. So I just happened to be going on a tour around the country talking to a lot of kids, and it just happened that there were three Episcopal schools, and they were around New Orleans, and so I told all these little Episcopalian kids about what, you know, you know Seton Belt loved the land and the Episcopal Church wanted to sell the land. And um, the Trust for Public Land had offered $4.5 million for the land, but the church had turned it down. And so these kids, uh, and then I was in Ohio and all over the country, so these kids wrote these amazing letters to the Episcopal Church. They were, Seton Belt trusted you. How could you go against it? Another kid wrote, you got the land for free. Can't you take the $4.5 million that the Trust for Public Land has offered you and save the land? And another kid wrote, God is going to be really mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> These kids' letters are so powerful that they got, the kids got asked to speak on the radio and on TV, and they ended up on Sunday morning news with Charles Osgood. And thousands of people saw them. They read their letters. They were in, actually in the, the Belt Woods. And the next week, the church announced that they were going to sell the land to the trust. It was a, it was a PR nightmare for them. <laughs> but kids have amazing power. So uh, these kids, um, this was in Michigan, and they were going to, the forest was going to be cut. This was, a, a, this was a, a, a forest where the teachers were actually using, using to teach math, social studies, science. All together, they would go, and they'd study the trees. They actually counted the number of trees um, and the different species of trees. And when they found that this was going to be sold, they went to the developer and said, you know, could, could you save it and call it the eternal forest of the children? And the developer said, well, we can't give it to you, but we could sell it to you for $100,000. These kids said, we're just in third grade. We don't have $100,000. But they started doing walkathons and bake sales, and then they got on the radio. They started doing these um, letters to the editor in their local newspaper, these third graders. And so many people saw them that they started um, that they got asked to be on TV, and when that happened, they got you know, all the checks started pouring in. And these kids raised not one hundred thousand dollars, but two hundred thousand dollars, and they saved this land. It's now the forest of the children, and uh, protected forever. So I started to realize through these stories as I was going around the country that kids have power. And now, flew the wood thrush can live happily ever after in the woods. So there are a lot of schools where this is happening. I was hoping that by now every school in this country would have a garden and that they'd be eating from it. I mean, it's happening slowly around, you know, especially with all these issues around food. Um, on this page is all these beneficial insects. And the, the, they say to the piano, if you promise not to use bug spray, we will clean your garden of insect pests. This is a really beautiful water feature that's in a school in Virginia. And, um, is what's amazing is when it's naturalized, then all these insects start coming, and the birds, and the butterflies, and it's just creating a natural habitat. 
So you know, how groundhogs start to grow through, I won't tell you the whole story, but they learn how to, the squirrel teaches this wayward groundhog how to teach, um, how to plant vegetables. And the groundhog is, is redeemed. He, he, he transforms his ways. And so here she's teaching him how to plant potatoes. And here I'm, I was on Martha Stewart teaching her how to plant potatoes, which was pretty interesting. Anyway, so um, I had been talking to Howard Zinn about trying to do a kids book of, of, of a people's history of the United States for kids. But I was having trouble coming up with that because it was kind of no happy endings there. And then I found a happy end. So I started with uh, Bill Cronin's book, Changes in the Land. And this book, by the way, was done at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, where I was uh, artist in residence for three years. And I, they were putting in a colonial uh, farm. So while I was there, I was a uh, consultant to that. And here, the, you know, the Indians drive the colonists, the, the colonists drive the Indians from the land, build mills, the mills start to pollute the river. And by the 1950s, this natural river was so polluted that it smelled even worse than it looked, and nothing was living in it. And this is a photograph, in case you think I'm exaggerating. And for any of you who want to have a, a film screening somewhere around here, there's now a movie called The Work of a Thousand, which is about this woman, Marion Stoddard, who organized the community to clean this river up. She's, uh, she lives in Groton, so she could actually come and speak. 83 years old. She's one of my role models. And um, in the book, this uh, one of the last remaining Indians has a dream. And in the dream, one of the first Indians who saw the river all beautiful and clean comes back and he sees it all polluted and smelling and he cries. And where his tears fall, the river is cleansed. And he, the Indian who had this dream woke up from the dream and he went to see Marion Stoddard, who was a friend of his, and together they began cleaning up the river. But it really was the kids who drove this, because the kids would go out there with signs like this, hold your nose, natural river ahead. And the people would, the adults would see it and say, wow, but it's impossible to clean this river up. It's too polluted, isn't it? But the kids would go and testify when they wanted to uh, actually allow even more pollution to go in the rivers. And they would say, this river was so clean when you were kids, you could fish in it. You could swim in it. You could drink it. And it shamed the adults. And they started to clean it up. And so now this is a beautiful, clean, clear river. A lot of teachers started taking their students down and doing water testing. And at first they found that it was so polluted that nothing was living there. It was all dead. But then as the laws got passed, because they actually lobbied for the first environmental protection, uh, the, the law in um, Massachusetts, the Clean Water Act in Massachusetts, got that passed. And then once the pollution started going in, the water did start to clean itself. And as generations of kids, um, tested that water. They saw it was getting cleaner and cleaner. And now I go canoeing with Marion Stoddard, and it's clean enough to swim in it and to fish in it, certainly kayak in it. And it's being used in almost every fourth grade around the country as part of the curriculum. So here's a great way of teaching science and then going out into your local community and doing water testing to see about your local environment. I wanted to connect space, you know, the whole planet, with uh, with a local area for kids so that I did this book, The Armadillo from Amarillo, where the armadillo goes up on the back of an eagle and they hook up with a space shuttle and they go up to uh, space, out to space. And I had to use the space shuttle because when I was growing up, one of my neighbors, Marsha Ivins, always wanted to be an astronaut. And she actually grew up and she became an astronaut. And that's her in the middle with the floating hair. She's been up in the space shuttle now four times, about two years apart. And she says you can actually see the changes on the Earth. From you, from time, from you know, for every two years when she goes up, like for instance, these, where there's clear cutting, there's these fingers of topsoil that go out into the ocean further and further. And this is one of the pictures she sent me, not from space, but when she got back, but she took it from the space shuttle. Um, and this is like all these rivers where there's um, clear cutting, and so these rivers, you know, of course, they go out to the ocean, and that siltation goes out to the ocean. But mangroves are really important ecosystem because they actually hold that silt in place and keep it from going out and covering coral reefs. So I wrote a mangrove book. And, uh, have, and it was funny because about a week after I, wrote, I had uh, this book came out, we had the hurricane uh, and the tsunami where um, all the animals kind of went uphill, they knew what was happening. And the um, mangrove, 
of several mangroves were not destroyed. It was only the places that had been developed that were kind of wiped off in the face of the earth. But of all these, of these environmental issues that we face, the really, I think the most scary to me is climate change. And so for years I've been trying to figure out how do we do something about it and how do we frame this for kids where it's not going to be scary. So Gary Grosh and I wrote this book, um, how, how We Know What We Know About Our Change in Climate. And it's all about the science of climate change. It's about the, uh, the scientists who've done the research. Um, we went to the Anastasia ruins, and I had just read Jared Diamond's an article um, from, about the Anastasia, and how, um, and then he subsequently wrote Collapse, about how these societies sort of dumbed themselves in. And the Anastasia, was, you know, they just cut, kept cutting trees, cutting trees until they changed their climate. And now we, um, with the CO2, we of course have the ability to do, to do ourselves in planetarily, the glaciers melting and all these things. But um, the hope, I really have a lot of hope because I think the young people are starting to really speak out and will hopefully make us um, change our ways with renewables. There's a lot of citizen science. Um, this is about the monarchs. Uh, migration. And one of the stories in this book is about how monarchs are changing their range due to climate change. Um, kids in Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. are all uh, communicating about the monarch migration through um, this uh, journey north. And this is a little girl in Mexico who's doing, taking, graphing the data. Baltimore Oriole is moving north. Might not be in Baltimore anymore. <laughs> At the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has Project Feeder Watch, and these are great citizen science projects for kids. Um, this is a density tube, so kids can learn about ocean, um, the ocean flow. Um, in one of these movies I'm going to show you, Anya um, is from Siberia. She works with a team of scientists at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And so um, I decided to, after I wrote, read the uh, wrote the climate book, I decided I wanted to do films and I wanted to tell the story about the success stories about kids who were actually reducing CO2 emissions. So um, the boy in the top middle, Danny, he is part of Team Marine and they found that 14 plastic bags are the equivalent of driving a mile. So they successfully got a ban on plastic bags in Santa Monica. This is Team Marine. And um, they dressed up as plastic bags and testified. That's, uh, you can watch that movie online, or I'm going to show you. I'm not sure which one I'm going to show you yet, but I'll show you some of them. And um, Jordan Howard is a green ambassador, and her school had just completely greened the school and had composting and uh, recycling, clean, clean plate club, clean canteens, just completely reduced their garbage stream, which was great. And now she's written a book called Green My Parents. And Felix, when he was nine, started Plant for the Planet, and I'm going to show you that movie. It's really beautiful. Um, he's now planted three million trees. These girls did an energy audit of their school in Florida, saved their school $53,000 in energy costs. And this is a model that could be at every school. And plus, you know, it's science and it's uh, data collection. It integrates everything. Alec Lohr's um, star group called Kids vs. Global Warming. And I'm making a longer movie about him. Um, this is when he was 12. I filmed him for Kids vs. Global Warming. He went and talked to Dick Norris, who's a scientist at Scripps. He didn't. He saw. He had seen an inconvenient truth, but he didn't want to take Al Gore's word for it. So he went and actually talked to some scientists like Dick at uh, Scripps. He went to the UN and he um, testified at the UN. Here he is. He's getting. He's growing. If you've noticed, he's growing in every all of these pictures. Um, then he started this I Matter campaign. He had the I Matter March. And he's now friends with Jim Hansen, spoke at Bioneers, and Ted, you can see his speeches online. And he wrote this Declaration of Independence from Fossil Fuel, which Hansen signed for his grandchildren. And now um, Alec, this is his Declaration of Independence from Fossil Fuel, and now Alec is, um, he's trying to see, well, he's suing the federal government for not being responsible toward future generations. And he's actually gotten a, a young person in every state to sue their state governments for not regulating carbon. And it'll really be interesting to see what happens with these lawsuits. And here he is um, speaking at Merck Museum of Natural History. And then 14,000 young people came to Washington to talk to their elected officials. So I'm going to show you a few of these films. 
And um, if you want to see the rest, they're online at youngvoicesfortheplanet.com. And I also have some DVDs if you're a teacher or you want to do um, any kind of public screenings of them. Um, the DVD is, you can, uh, you can show it. The other ones are, are really not um, very good resolution. What time is it? Oh, good. OK, so I can show you about three of these. I think I'll start with Halleck. studying global climate change. And we're also speaking to kids who have reduced the climate footprint of their, their homes, their schools, their communities, and even their states. We're interviewing many young people who are fighting for their future. And they're fighting for the protection of the natural world. My name is Alec Boers. I am 13 years old. I'm in eighth grade and I go to Ventura Charter School. I never knew about climate change at all until I saw Al Gore's movie and in an Inconvenient Truth. Kids are the ones who will be most affected by global warming. By the time we're middle-aged, climate change will be a huge crisis if nothing is done today to help us. I went ahead and I made my own presentation, um, and I made mine especially for kids, and I incorporated videos and animation and hands-on demonstrations so that kids would be excited about it. I have the website, kidsvsglobalwarming.com. The passion has been Alex. And he kept coming up with ideas, like one night he designed all of these I Matter logos. Mom, look what I did at 2 in the morning. Here's our first 20 second video. to alert my city, Ventura, about the dangers of sea level rise and how it will affect us. The project is called SLAP. SLAP stands for Sea Level Awareness Project. Because of global warming, polar ice caps are melting, causing the sea level to rise. And if Greenland completely melted, which could happen in the next century, sea level would rise over 20 feet worldwide. This would be Ventura. So here's what we'll be doing. We're going to be putting up over 100 poles throughout the city warning of this potential sea level rise. On the pole, there's the I Matter campaign, and then there's also five or six images that show what we can do about it. This is the Declaration of Independence from Colorado, and it's from the Youth of Ventura.
can look at the um, credits when you go home if you're interested. <laughs> I'm going to show you this one about Olivia Buller. She's a New York native and swimming in those waters and seeing those birds. It was such a 
to me a whirlwind? First, it was the local press register. Then spread to the UK. The Guardian UK published an article saying, Schoolgirl Shames BP. From there, it went viral. Then Huffington Post. Then AOL flipped. It was going crazy. My mother was getting like 100 emails an hour. Belgian newspapers, Italian TV. My mom was having a heart attack. <gasps> what should I do? What do I do? Mainstream media in the United States picked it up. CBS News, USA Today, People. 144 million people see my story. Two months. 144 million people. It tells you people want to help, but they just don't know how. That's why I think they need a role model like you to say, if a child can do it, so can I. I can make a difference. Olivia encouraged us to name our representatives in Washington, D.C. to advocate for alternative energy and the birds. We actually met with Ken Salazar. We should stop offshore drilling, stop relying on other countries. Have you ever seen a solar panel break down and it ends a whole ecosystem, destroys a whole way of life for people and animals? Have you ever heard of a solar spill? You don't have to do what I do. But everything that you do for our planet counts.
So I want to um, really also thank um, the teachers who are integrating a lot of these real world issues into their classrooms and um, allowing kids to really have some impact locally, globally, and um, realize that science is not an isolated thing, math is not isolated, but you know, all these things together is what is the way we need to be teaching kids to um, be solving the world's problems in the world they're going to be inheriting. So um, I'm going to stop so we have some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? to get involved with the local schools and what, this is what this Green Corps project is. Um, actually, Olivia is, she doesn't go to school here in New York State. She goes to school in Islip, New York, but she, but her parents in the summer live just north of Saugerties. So that's where I filmed her in the, their, their summer place in Saugerties. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's for a year, and these are really free form. But, um, I was uh, artist in residence at Cornell, and usually I go in and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I talk to the scientists, and I, I learn science, and I go out with them in the field, and then usually I come up with some kind of project I want to write about or do a film about. So um, the, the climate book actually incorporated the science from a lot of different places where I've been artists and residents, like the Marine Biological Lab in uh, Woods Hole and the Woods Hole Resources Center and Cornell and Princeton um, Environmental Institute. And so um, I'm just, I've only been here a couple weeks and so it's, I don't know what I'll end up, um, you know, I don't know how what I'm learning here will end up coming uh, through into a project, but inevitably it will. Nikki, let me give a plug for that program that picks up on that. Is, it, is that this is a newly established uh, writer and artist in residence program here, and, and purposefully, we have very few constraints or expectations of deliverables from the participants. We basically want to have them be able to come here, interact with some scientists, and be creative, and you know, may the best of come up with question over. Yeah, actually, there, yeah, there's this really great curriculum I can share with you um, that shows about um, how water, you know, the whole water cycle, but also how it percolates down into the aquifers and, and you know, how that, um, all that kind of thing. And that would be a really great project to work on and get kids involved. Thank you. No one here. Um, I, I want to try to write oh, sorry, you, you were talking about the Green Corps Planet. Because 
It's not that the children don't have to vote. It's that the power brokers and corporations, <laughs> CEOs, the decision makers don't care and don't understand because they aren't going to be there when Miami floods. Or they don't believe it. That's why um, with these stories, I'm focusing on win-win. Like, for example, um, in Dreaming and Dream, um, Nicole is the, um, the girl on the far left, in the orange. Her dad is a very conservative um, businessman. And he was making fun of her trying to save um, one energy in her school. And when she showed him the numbers that they had saved $53,000, suddenly he thought, whoa, he has all these buildings in Miami. He went and he switched out all his air conditioning units and put in Energy Star units, saving, saving himself thousands of dollars. And I, even, I filmed him. He actually looks like a movie star. I, and I have to use this footage somewhere, but he says, um, no, all I care about is the bottom line. I admit it. But if going green is going to save me money, I'm going to go green. And so, you know, unfortunately, I think that's how this, you know, this country works. And so I think uh, with a lot of these things, that's what we're focusing on, is like, you know, with ecosystem services, which is a, a book that I've been wanting to write, you know, we don't value those services. We're not actually putting a monetary value on them, but we need to be doing that. And that's something that kids can actually get involved in. You know, they can, you know, we can, we can develop a curriculum that helps them to put monetary value on the water, on the clean air. Like, for instance, uh, you know about how they were going to build a, a big, water purification plant in New York City. Was this a turn of the century? And they, and instead, someone convinced them that they should build a big pipeline from um, Catskills, yeah. and that they'd get pure drinking water, they wouldn't be recycling this filthy river water, and um, it would cost less. And so they did it, and now New York has great water supply. So I think that these are the kinds of stories these success stories that we need to get out because if we can, I mean, it's not always going to be the case that it's going to be the cheapest, but um, Texas, they um, were going to build a dam. And they, and, and someone did the math and said, look, if you just get everybody load flow toilets, that it costs less than building the dam. You're not damming up the stream where all the fishermen want to be fishing and the fish want to go up it. And so they did this. This whole town bought, built it, they bought the town low flow toilets instead of the dam. So I think it's thinking outside the box. Kids are really good at that. And kids are really effective lobbyists. I mean, every hearing I've gone to where the kids, where the kids show up, it's like when you, when you show up and you say, you know, this, this river, you know, when, when you were young, you could swim in it, you could drink in it, you could drink it. End of argument. They wouldn't allow more pollution in that river. So I think it's giving the kids the power that they have. And I think we can do it. Lynn, many thanks. This has been uh, a wonderful uh, description of what you've been up to and poignant stories from throughout the history uh, of your work and that your work is done. So it's a, a really nice presentation. Lynn will be out uh, front here shortly. Uh, whatever your holiday coming up, enjoy it. But mark your calendar on, for January 20, Friday, uh, when our next public program will be held here. Uh, Orrin Pilkey from Duke University, who's written widely on beach erosion, uh, beach reconfiguration, the effect of sea level rise on beaches and beach communities will be here uh, to tell us what it means to be right at uh, the land sea interface uh, during the coming century. Uh, so many thanks to you for coming.